Racing games are kind of like pizza. Even when they're bad, they're still pretty good. Racing is also a genre with a ton of variety. Stock car, rally car, Mario car, Sonic car, sports car. There is a lot to love and something truly for everyone. Because racing is a genre that everyone is a fan of, to at least some extent, they make good launch titles. And when the PS3 launched, Sony was looking to hit the 7th generation running with some good looking titles to showcase what the PS3 was capable of. One of those games was Motorstorm, a fantastic looking racer complete with destructible vehicles and a dirty but amazing visual aesthetic. Motorstorm was once one of the games at the pinnacle of off-road racing. It quickly rose to becoming one of the staples of Sony's PlayStation platform to becoming completely forgotten in just about a short 6 years later. Evolution Studios was founded in 1999 by Martin Kenwright and Ian Hetherington. Evolution Studios primarily focused on working with Sony and utilizing Sony's World Rally Championship license. Evolution Studios' time with the World Rally Championship license consisted of five titles spanning between the years of 2001 and 2005. These were structured similarly to how many sports games today are structured, with new additions coming out yearly, each with new cars and drivers for that season. These all received relatively positive reviews and were generally regarded as good titles. But after the release of World Rally Evolved in 2005, Evolution Studios would step away from the World Rally Championship license in favor of expanding its horizons. At E3 2005, Sony Computer Entertainment would show off Evolution Studios' new project. Motorstorm. This unveiling, however, wasn't met without controversy. Sony showed off a trailer for the new Motorstorm project that was simply jaw-dropping. The game looked amazing. Crashes were shown in fantastic detail with particles of cars and bikes flying everywhere. Mud would splatter on windshields when kicked up by drivers in front of you even alluding to the player having control of windshield wipers to wipe off the mud. Developers, gaming journalists, and gamers alike were blown away. Was this the power of the PS3? Would games like Motorstorm and another massive title that Sony debuted in E3 2005 and Killzone 2 actually end up looking as good as it did in the trailers? Well, 17 years later, it's clear that the answer to that question is no. But at the time, it was a lot less clear. You see, this was just a target render of what the final product of the game should look like. And there's a lot of finger pointing, but it would appear that the trailer was created by Sony without Evolution Studios' blessing. The lead designer of Evolution Studios, Nigel Kershaw, and the creative director, Paul Hollywood, mentioned in an interview with 1UP that it wasn't created by them and before they had even received the official hardware specifications from Sony. Nevertheless, Evolution Studios still had to deliver a product that was at least close to what that target render showed. The first of five Motorstorm titles would officially launch in Japan in December of 2006 and the North American and European market in March of 2007. Once the game launched, it quickly became one of the best games in the PS3's launch window. The visuals, while not quite up to that level of the E3 2005 rendering, were still fantastic and showed off what the PS3 was capable of. The story of Motorstorm, well, is pretty much non-existent, but that's okay. All you need to know is that there is a racing festival happening in the middle of the desert and you'll have the opportunity to ride and race against motorbikes, ATV, mud pluggers, rally cars, buggies, racing trucks, and even big rigs. And the best part is, all these vehicle classes can race against one another at the same time. Meaning that you can run bikes off the sides of mountains with your semi, or reach the highest point of the level and jump over those big rigs and rally cars in your motorbike or ATV. Which brings me to what makes Motorstorm such an unforgettable racing game. Each vehicle has specific strengths and weaknesses, which depending on the section of level or path that you take in your race can mean that you'll either be at an advantage or a disadvantage. If you're on a bike or ATV, you're better off taking higher up paths in mountains or elevated terrain as you're more nimble and can more easily make jumps and take falls a whole heck of a lot easier than a big rig or a rally car could. But selecting these bigger vehicles doesn't necessarily put you at a disadvantage either, as these tend to do better in more muddier or congested areas of the track as you can bully other racers more effectively. Motorstorm is all about picking the right racing routes for the vehicle that you're in or figuring out how to get by if you find yourself on the wrong path or in a sticky situation. But what would any racing game be without its courses? And Motorstorm has some really good ones. 
My personal favorite is Dust Devil, a course with jumps for the smaller vehicles, lots of mud and trenches for the larger ones, and places where the smaller and larger vehicles have to intersect with one another and hazards all throughout. There is also a boost meter that adds another level of complexity to the game. You're able to boost for a short period of time to give yourself some extra speed and launch yourself in front of other racers. However, if you boost too much and overload your boost meter, you'll blow up. But this gives you a lot of risk slash reward situations. For example, it might be a good idea to boost as much as possible right before crossing the finish line in a tough race. But you better be sure that you don't blow up right before that finish line. While Motorstorm did fall short of its E3 trailer, it still looks amazing and encapsulates that chaotic atmosphere that the trailer was trying to convey. Mud and dust still flies everywhere, there are explosions and your vehicle will completely fall apart if you're in a crazy collision. Motorstorm also came with a good amount of DLCs, with two packs releasing, that in Devil's Weekend and Revenge Weekend, that each came with a new map, new vehicles, and new vehicle skins. Two other maps were also released in the map pack, which includes Eagle's Nest and Diamondback Speedway tracks. Other small amounts of DLC were also released in the form of vehicle skins. We here at Big Green Gaming give this game a 9 out of 10. What do the critics think? As you can see, it's got quite the range, with some outlets giving it a C plus and some outlets giving it an almost an A minus rating. Motorstorm sold roughly 3 million copies by February 2008 and quickly became one of the best sellers on the up and coming PlayStation 3. The executives at Sony took notice. In 2007, after the release of the original Motorstorm, Sony acquired Evolution Studios and its subsidiary company, Big Big Studios, for a whopping 32.6 million. Michael Denny, Senior Vice President of Worldwide Studios at Sony, was quoted saying, We've enjoyed a highly productive and commercially successful relationship with Evolution, and now there is a great opportunity in bringing them into a part of the family to share further in terms of technology, production methodology, and creative goals to make the experiences that these teams are creating even better. Evolution's first game under the Sony umbrella would be a follow-up to the original Motorstorm title. Motorstorm Pacific Rift is where the Motorstorm series would hit its apex. And if you've been following along, you'll know that this is only the second of five games, which obviously doesn't bode well for the rest of the franchise, but we'll cross those bridges when we come to them. It's difficult to call Pacific Rift a true sequel. It feels like a map and car pack with a few added features more than a sequel, but it's still really, really solid and does a lot to refine the MotorStorm formula. The best thing about Pacific Rift is its variety. Instead of several different but similar looking tracks, like in the original, there are lots of tracks, but they all have different themes and designs. For example, there's a Earth Festival where the environments are very lush and jungly, a Fire Festival where you literally race over a volcano, a Water Festival where there's, well, lots of water, and Air where you race up high in the mountains. Pacific Rift is also home to my favorite map in the franchise, Caldera Ridge. In this map, you'll be encountered with a massive decline that you can either choose to race down like a normal person, or fling yourself off the edge of a mountain, dodge some rocks, and maybe get an edge on those who went the long way around. Just because the game is really similar to the original from a gameplay perspective doesn't mean it fails to innovate. The boost meter now has some added functionality. It can be cooled off, allowing you to boost longer or boost sooner by driving through water. It can also be heated up, making your boost not as effective and much more deadly. These risk events are placed through the map and can result in some really interesting decisions. Other than that, Pacific Rift is the MotorStorm gamers had come to enjoy by that time, just packaged a lot better with adding new features for good measure. The critics mostly agreed, giving it a B plus score. IGN even gave it a 8.9 out of 10. Pacific Rift also received some DLC of its own, including the Adrenaline Expansion Pack which consisted of three new tracks, four new vehicles, 26 new vehicle color schemes, six new characters with all six receiving three possible outfits, all retailing for the price of $9.99, which is actually a really good value considering all the new content. But wait, there's even more. The Adrenaline Pack also includes five Volcanic Remixes, which, as the name suggests, remix several tracks from Pacific Rift and adds lava and exploding volcanoes all over the place. If you include these tracks in the new track count, that's eight new tracks added to this expansion pack. The Adrenaline Pack wasn't the only DLC pack Pacific Rift received. Pacific Rift was also given another hefty expansion by the way of the Speed Expansion Pack, 
which again provides players with three new tracks, four new vehicles, with each having three unique paint schemes, and several different paint schemes for other vehicles in the game, and a new game mode called Speed Events. Pacific Rift also had a bunch of extra DLC in the form of extra vehicles and color schemes. So really, MotorStorm fans had to be really pleased with this entry. A good base game and a ton of really solid DLC. So what was next for the series? As I mentioned earlier, the developer of MotorStorm Evolution Studios had a subsidiary company in Big Big Studios, and they wanted their own shot at making a MotorStorm game and they came up with a very unique game by taking the MotorStorm series to an environment it had never been in before, and that was very, very different from all the previous environments it had been in. Big Big Studios took MotorStorm to the Arctic Edge. MotorStorm Arctic Edge released on two platforms, the PSP and the PS... Wait, hang on, that can't be right. Let me look at my notes here real quick, guys. The PS2, not the PS3. Yeah, so this game launched on the PS2, which makes it one of the only games I can think of where a sequel came out on a generation prior to the original game without also releasing on that first game's generation. But let me know if there are more examples of this in the comments. Anyway, Arctic Edge is largely the same as the first two MotorStorm games, but now is slightly scaled down to perform well on the PSP and the PS2. And not only does it perform well, it plays really well. The typical MotorStorm vehicles are here, but also with the addition of the Snowcat and the Snowplugger. The maps here, in my opinion, are also on par with that of the original game but also for the first time introducing a new element where the map can change dynamically. Here's an example where a driver drives over the ice bridge before I'm able to, causing it to collapse and I have to take a different route. The PS2 version was not actually developed by Big Big Studios. Instead, it was ported to the PS2 by Virtuo Studios and lacked a few features that the PSP version had, including an online multiplayer mode and a photo mode, but did feature significantly upscaled visuals and reflections. While Arctic Edge as a whole is certainly a less graphically impressive motor storm, it does still hold a candle to its big brother counterparts on the PS3. And most outlets agreed with that assessment, with most giving it a 7 out of 10, and IGN even giving the PSP version a 9 out of 10. At this point, the MotorStorm franchise was at what I consider to be its peak. Two solid games showcasing the PS3's graphical power, and a portable game that managed to bring the adrenaline field experiences to handheld devices. All entries in this series had been reviewed well, the DLC for each game was strong, and most importantly, the games were fun. In 2011, the fourth entry in the MotorStorm series would debut and it would take the series in a brand new direction, promising to be much more ambitious than the original or Pacific Rift. In March of 2011, MotorStorm Apocalypse would release. The concept for Apocalypse was unique and honestly a really good idea. As I've mentioned so many times in this video, all the MotorStorm games have done an excellent job in making the player feel that they were in complete chaos during the race, where you had to not only be on your toes to win, but to survive. Taking that feeling and applying it to the environment itself was just the natural progression of the franchise, except, well, kind of failed in execution. First of all, Apocalypse tries to tell a story this time, with a full-blown campaign mode, something that was absent from the first games, and the story is really, really bad. The writing is cringy at best, and the dialogue is really overacted. The story is also shown in a comic book, graphic novel style, and honestly, I just can't see the reason as to why it needed to be included. But nevertheless, this shouldn't matter as long as the gameplay itself is fine, and, well, fine is how I describe it, because it's just fine. MotorStorm Apocalypse feels much more arcadey than the first few entries did with damage not really meaning nearly as much, and turning being much less of an issue, and so much so that you really don't have to slow down at all, and your vehicle is just able to kind of handle turns that it feels like it really shouldn't be able to. Speaking of vehicles, you are no longer able to select which vehicle type you'd like for each race. It's completely predetermined. Which I guess is fine, considering each of the tracks branching paths are more or less the same, and don't lend themselves more to a specific vehicle type like in the prior games. There is no taking the high road with motorcycles to get over vehicles bigger than you, 
or selecting a dune buggy to drive over rougher terrain while your opponent struggle. All these vehicles are more or less on an even playing field regardless of which branching path you take outside of the obvious size differences, which is a huge letdown, as this was a huge part of MotorStorm and quite honestly the best part of it. As the title suggested, MotorStorm Apocalypse takes place during the end of the world. To be more specific, it takes place in a apocalyptic California. This gives the game some really cool set pieces such as racing on the Golden Gate Bridge. The end of the world also brings people who try to cause havoc or prevent havoc, and both of these elements are present in the game, where people will try to shoot you, ram you off the track, or shoot missiles at you to keep you from racing from a helicopter. The maps are also more dynamic than ever featuring areas that will completely blow up and force you to take another path. You can also now air cool your car to keep the boost meter down. If you're in a jump, all you have to do is lay off that accelerator and your boost meter will decrease drastically. But these new features are not enough to overcome its shortcomings. Apocalypse just doesn't feel like a MotorStorm game. It feels like Evolution Studios described what MotorStorm was to a developer who had only worked on iPhone racing games in the past, and this is what they came up with. For what might be a first in the Forgotten franchise, critics do not agree with me. Most outlets gave this game a B- to B score, which is probably true if you look at this game for what it is on its own, but in the greater context of MotorStorm, it's just such a huge letdown. Apocalypse also had some DLC, but only consisted of new cars or accessories for cars. These are nice to haves, but to me, nowhere near as substantial as having new tracks to race on. So for me, this makes Apocalypse all the more disappointing. At this point, you're probably thinking, where will MotorStorm go next? Just to recap, the series has taken us to the Grand Canyon, the jungle, volcanoes, the Arctic, and even an apocalyptic version of California. Well, what if I told you that in the next game, you'll not only be able to revisit those locations, but visit new ones as well. So let's get into it. I'm pumped guys. Let's look at some gameplay footage. Oh. In 2012, the second portable MotorStorm game launched, MotorStorm RC, where you now have an aerial view of your vehicle and are no longer behind the wheel, but instead you are behind the remote because your car is, well, obviously a RC car. MotorStorm RC launched on the ill-fated PS Vita and the PlayStation 3, where, as I mentioned, you can race tracks based on Monument Valley, Pacific Rift, Arctic Edge, and even Apocalypse. This game as a whole is a massive departure from what MotorStorm fans had come to expect. In a lot of ways, that's a negative thing, as the chaotic, dust-in-your-face, fast-paced, car could blow up at any second style that the first four games had is completely gone and, in its place, is a experience that feels at arm's length rather than you being in the action. In a lot of ways, MotorStorm RC is indeed a love letter, but it's also a completely different experience. But sometimes, a completely different experience isn't a bad thing either, because MotorStorm RC is still a ton of fun. There are the basic race modes that the series has become known for, but there are also modes like this one, where the goal is to overtake as many cars as possible within a set time frame. The maps are still really, really cool and have a ton of variety, but also did a good job of capturing the verticality of the series in a different package, including having tons of branching paths in what is mostly a 2D track. Unfortunately though, the alternate routes that are better for certain vehicles are completely gone. Which leads me to the vehicles. The vehicle classes that were in the other MotorStorm games make a return and each have their own benefits. My biggest gripe with the game though are the controls. They're bad. Like, really really bad. Evolution Studios was clearly trying to simulate a RC controller, but for me at least, it is just really hard to get the hang of for some reason. Thankfully, there is an alternative mode where steering is a bit easier, but just as I felt like I was getting the hang of it, I'll end up not thinking about the controls enough and go crashing right into the wall. So take that for what you will. MotorStorm RC not only had DLC, it had a ton of it. It had two expansion packs that included tracks, with the Pro-Am expansion pack including four tracks and the Carnival pack including six tracks. In total, close to 70 vehicles were released as DLC, including the Scion IQ for some reason. MotorStorm RC received mostly positive reviews, with most outlets giving it a B score. I believe this is in line with my feelings as well. This is definitely a different experience, but it is by no means a bad one. 
Motorstorm RC is a good time. Over the course of six years, Motorstorm saw five releases on four different platforms and a ton of DLC for almost all of those releases. During that period of time, Motorstorm was a staple in Sony's arsenal of first-party exclusives, until it wasn't. Motorstorm RC was the last game in the series. So what happened? After the release of Motorstorm RC, things started to move really fast for Evolution Studios, but not in a good way. Evolution released Drive Club just a few years later in 2014, and a year after that, 55 Evolution Studios employees were laid off by Sony. Then, in 2016, Evolution Studios as a whole was officially shuttered. What about Big Big Studios? After the release of Motorstorm Arctic Edge, they released the game Little Deviants on the PS Vita, a minigame collection that received pretty middling reviews. After the release of Little Deviants, Big Big Studios was shut down by Sony. What about Virtuous Studios, the team that worked on the PS2 port of Arctic Edge? Well, they are still thriving today and continue to make ports for various popular franchises including Dying Light, but primarily focus on outsourcing employees to work on various projects for other companies. The good news though is that while the companies that worked on Motorstorm are no longer in business, a lot of the employees from Evolution Studios were brought on by Codemasters to work on the game Onrush which did review really well. But the future of the Motorstorm franchise itself is very unclear. It's been 10 years since the last game, and there has been no mention of the once great racing franchise. I really wish Sony would either reboot the series or at least remaster it. It would be awesome to play these games with a more powerful engine as the environments would really pop and the vehicle destruction would be next level. But what do you think? Be sure to let us know in the comments below, like and subscribe for more content, but most importantly, take care, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next video.